So you said stare at the camera. <laughs> Just dead, don't blink. Yeah. <laughs> So James, welcome to uh, Course 77 101. Thanks. Uh, so glad to have you on. Yeah, this is great. So we've known each other for, when do you think we met? Um, well, that would have been back in 2005, right. I think. I think about then. Yeah. We were both featured in a mobile PC magazine. That's right. They did like a, you know, had designers contribute to like the future of tech and we both were in it, and then I remember you reached out. And yeah. I was like, hey, you're in town, I'm in town. And we probably got lunch like once a month at least. Yeah. That, from then on. I think it's because I recognized your name. Okay. Uh, and I think that was because I was really, like we were just talking about, I was really active on Core 77 at yeah. that time. Yeah. So I think I had seen your name on Core 77. Robert. I was like, okay, I recognize that name. And I think this guy's local, so I'll just reach out. Yeah. Uh, because again, it was just, it's always for me, like getting to know people in the design community. Yeah. Um, just making connections, getting more information, meeting people, understanding their process, yeah. all that stuff. Totally. You know, most of the time it works out, sometimes it doesn't, but most of the time it works out. It works out, and I think in this case it did. Yeah. It worked out great. So well, that yeah. was like 15 years ago. So yeah, it's like you like Voltron, Depeche Mode. Like, <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. Um, All the 80s stuff. Yeah, I remember that. I think the thing that you did was like on point, like ahead of its time, but on point you did that. It was like a DJ mixing thing that was kind of like that. If I remember yeah. Right, with like a little like kind of like volcano dial. And, um, but now like when you look at like the proliferation of like, uh, you know, all the like teenage engineering but was like who who would have thought after the convergence of everything into phones and laptops there would be this explosion of like tiny music mixing things yeah and that was basically kind of like your concept of like taking digital music and putting it into like a little device if I remember right yeah so that that little that was just a concept that I did on my own right. um, because uh, if I have an idea or a concept that I really feel strongly about, I want to chase it down at least to a certain level, either uh, uh, do a Photoshop sketch or cat it up and mm -hmm. render it in Keyshot or, or whatever photorealistic software. Uh, but in this case, um, I actually, I did cat it up, I created storyboards for the idea, and then uh, I got it into uh, the Taiwan design competition and, gotcha. and made it to the final round. And so for the final round, they actually want you to create a model. So that's why I created a model of that, um, of that device. But I also still like the idea. And, and, and actually, I still show it sometimes yeah. to clients, even though it's 15 years old, um, because I, I think you're right that, yes, we have these convergent devices that do everything, right. iPhone, uh, whatever Android devices, they, they do it all, but we still have a lot of products that are niche and only really do one thing well mm -hmm. because people still want that. Yeah. And in this case, this was just purely wireless music mixing before right. really we had prolific streaming media. Right. This is back in 2005, we barely had Wi-Fi. Right. Um, yeah. And this was before we had a lot of wireless devices that you could, you know, get, uh, you could draw sources from. So that was what that was supposed to be, was a music mixing device that you could do live. Right. You could mix music on the fly. And you could draw the music from different sources, from mm -hmm. any device that's connected to the network. You could draw uh, MP3 files from that, or whatever files, and then mix it together. And that was what was that was the key feature was that you could mix music together live, right? So that would be fun for somebody who wants a small device to mix music to either practice or just right. do a casual DJ session at a party or whatever. You don't have to have the big device with uh, you know the two wheels or totally. whatever. So I they, remember, I mean, because it really was like one or two years after the iPod came out. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, really. So yeah, and again, at the time there was really. Streaming just didn't exist. No. It was that we, we barely had MP3s. Right. Um, it's like, oh, I got some digital music on my iPod, but the only way I can get to it is on my iPod. Yeah. Like, I can't share it wirelessly. I can't stream it. I can't do anything. So, right. just thinking about into the future, like, okay, 10 years from now, can we do this? Yeah, probably we could do it. Yeah. Um, you know, there will be a lot more uh, resources to stream music into a device. And then people, that, and that was really the goal was to let the user 
take this content and mix it together into a playlist for a, um, a session right. that they wanted to create. It was all about creation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and I think like I mean at the time, yeah, Pandora didn't didn't exist. Yeah, and then when streaming did come out, it was like Pandora where you couldn't even pick a song. Right. right. So, but that's definitely where it went. Um, I don't know if you remember my concept that got published in the magazine was a I digital do. wallet, yeah. <laughs> which which actually became an app. But yeah. but at the time I was just like, yeah, why do we have all these credit cards and like why can't and and my concept was that even your driver's license, all right. those things <clears throat> should be in a secure single. I kind of a very fan of like what I call single task devices, yeah, just like that. Where like I'm like I just want it to hold all my financial stuff and my ID stuff and like be safe and shielded. Um, but they're still not really there yet no, no. because I mean they are trying to roll that in I mean yeah on your Apple watch or your Android gear there's you can have your credit cards and some stuff but I mean you know the issue is is that yeah you have some of your financial stuff on your phone for instance which is where most people have their cards right, right. or their their smartwatch but uh, you know ID is still a real a really big problem right. so how do you deal with a driver's license that's regulated by the government right. like how can you get that onto a digital device the state government so, so you right. can't even just have like one national standard, which would be make it easier, probably. That's right. So, so I see opportunities in identification, right, mm -hmm. and uh, actually licensing. So, mm -hmm. like, how do you work with state governments to get a digital version of your license onto your smart device, right, right, and not be easily compromised. I mean, any, you can still fake an, a driver's license, so that's really not the issue. Security is still not great with driver's right. licenses, totally. but you know, you I wanna. Mean, the only innovation there has been the addition of mag strips, right? So yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. And, yeah. and I mean, they, they play with fancy backgrounds and reflective right. coatings to make it Holograms. hard to, to do, yeah. but but if you're just glancing at it, you're not gonna notice that the security right. features, but um, there's gotta be a digital version of ID at some point mm -hmm. that goes right. on your phone, that goes on your watch, goes on whatever device. So we got to get there, and then I, the one thing I've always thought about was was uh, um, um, tags for your car, right? License plates. Yeah, yeah. So in the enthusiast community, people always complain about front-mounted license plates, uh, yeah, and, totally. and you, you see people doing all kinds of things to get away from mounting a license plate on the front of their car. They either have it in their window, or mm -hmm. they have these little devices that retract it into their bumper. I haven't seen that. Yeah, there's a there's a little device that it, it'll retract at a car, so you can retract it at a yeah. car show and then deploy it when you need. Oh, got it. Uh, like cars and coffee, but yeah. you know the one thing I've is is the license plate is super old technology, yeah. and cars are evolving so quickly now, mm -hmm. and the modes of transport are changing so quickly, and we're still using this metal stamped plate. Yeah. <laughs> On with the stickers. <laughs> yeah, a, a sticker right, to you know renew your registration. Yeah. On the front and the back of your car that is just totally antithetical to where design is going and where transportation is going. So that uh, whole identification system for, for vehicles needs to be totally rethought. Mm -hmm. But again, you'd have to work with state and federal governments to change that. I don't know how you do it, but I've, I've been thinking about that too. Like it would be really cool if it was just like a, a UPC code that's tone on tone or right. just a clear uh, sticker that goes on your bumper so you can't really see it but you can scan it or maybe it's yeah. laser etched or there's so many things you could do that would still identify your vehicle but not be so intrusive mm -hmm. as a white metal plate or whatever color on the front and back of your car. Yeah. <laughs> Which... and I've been told the, the only reason for a front plate because it, it's almost impossible to read a plate coming towards you Right. Um, the only reason why it's there is for a meter mark. Mm -hmm. So then you're like, well, I put a, I'd rather a sticker on my windshield. Right? Yeah. If it's uh, if it's just a convenience. That's right. It could be on your windshield. Right. That's right. And and I mean, and it's not consistent among states. There's right. some states don't have front plates. Yeah, I, I believe. I don't know if this is true, but car guys in Cal when I was in California, they told me like there's a, you can get like what's called a fix it ticket there, which is basically like you just gotta get it fixed. Yeah. And you pay a fine. Um, but if you are there's some kind of weird loophole where if there was no front plate bracket on the car, you can be like, well, it didn't, there's no bracket. Right. And so a lot of times dealers there will be like, do you, the, the brackets do you are really dealer the brackets? installed. So they were yeah. like, do you want us to not install it? So right. I was like, no, I don't want it. And then there's no front yeah. plate. And, like, and I've never, you know, I have front plates and I've never had issues. Yeah. 
but I don't know how that'll go over here. That doesn't work in Oregon. I you tried that. You tried it? Yeah, it doesn't okay. work. So I've got a front plate now. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, that doesn't work. Okay. That doesn't work. Good to know. Yeah. Um, yeah, but they probably get double ticket knowing that, well, in California, sir, you're like, oh, here's another ticket. Yeah, they, they, don't, they don't do that here. Yeah. It's like, no, no, sorry, you got to put a front plate on there. Yeah. They don't care. So, so what got you into, uh, shifting gears a little, what got you into industrial design? Well, that is a very good question, and I, I've talked about this to many people, and it's very clear for me. So I know that for some designers, they either fall into it because mm -hmm. they went into engineering, or sometimes they went into a profession or a major that wasn't even related to design. Like right. They became accountants or, or physical therapists, and they went, oh, I like design, so I'll do that. But yeah. for me, um, and this is, but still, this is a lot of designers are like this too. I've heard the story where they always uh, were creators. Right. Mm -hmm. They always liked making things and designing things. So, you know, I started sketching and drawing when I was a little kid, but I kept doing it. So, you know, kids are creative. They always draw and sketch. They explore that. But typically what happens with kids, they, they stop doing it at a certain point. Right. Right. Like in when they're eight, nine or ten, they stop doing it. But, but yeah. uh, you know, for those who are, are artists, designers, creators, they keep sketching. And then that sketching turns into like model making. Right. or playing with Legos. So, I mean, I started playing with Legos when I was three or four. I got my first kit from my grandmother when I was a little kid, but, and that really stuck. And then I wanted more and more Legos and I kept drawing and making things with Legos. Then as I got older, I got into model making and really trying to perfect my painting techniques and trying to really improve my craftsmanship. Mm -hmm. So it was really, uh, and I didn't really have a mentor for that. I, I was always a drive inside to just try to get better and better, which I think is very important for designers. You should always try to keep improving no matter where you are in your career, how good you are. Always, you can always improve. There's was, always a way to get better. I always call that like having a healthy level of dissatisfaction. You're, yeah. You're just, you're dissatisfied enough that you're like, I'm going to do it again. I'm yeah. going to do better. I'm doing not better. so dissatisfied. You're like, I'm not going to wake up anymore. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah. right? It's like that weird balance. Yeah. You don't want to fall into a depression because right. you think you can never get there. You can right. get there and you can be satisfied mm -hmm. with reaching a different level. Like, right. Hey, I reached this level. I'm satisfied, but you know what? I think I can do a little better. I think I can go a little bit farther. That's a great way to put it. Yeah. Right. So you can, you can always improve and then you'll be satisfied with that mm -hmm. and you can move forward again. Um, so, uh, you know, I was just enthralled with making, drawing, creating, and playing. Mm -hmm. And I use the word playing because I think play is a very important word. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you become an adult, people say, okay, well, playtime's over. You need to be an adult right. and pay your bills. Okay, yeah, you need to pay your bills. But playing is hugely critical for creativity. And there's actually a, a person that I knew from Ziva Design now lives in Boston, and he runs a Lego playgroup for executives. Really? Yeah. So they actually have a program for executives and companies, and they they have a set of blocks, just generic Lego blocks, that they have the executives play with to help them kind of clear their mind and reset their mind before they start brainstorming, discussing a new topic thinking about their business. Interesting. And it's like called reset. Yeah, it's called creative play. Mm -hmm. And it and what playing does, in my opinion, uh, is it helps get you out of typical thought patterns. Yeah. Right? It and, and actually the creators of South Park do it too. So mm -hmm. the one of the creators of South Park, he actually buys all these little these little mini Lego that. kits. Yeah. yeah. I saw an interview with him about that. Yeah, and he'll just yeah. take a break during his day, right. he'll make a Lego kit and then he'll go back to his work because uh, that <laughs> yeah, that actually helps. It, it's a task that helps clear your mind of all the garbage that you've been thinking of up to that point. And you cannot move forward creatively until you get the garbage out. And that can be anything. That can be taking a walk, yeah. going to get a cup of coffee, watching television for half an hour. Although that's not the best, but right. you know, it's it's really about getting away from the task that you're currently doing. And yeah. play play does that, yes. right? So so whether it's building a Lego kit or sketching a little bit or going out and throwing the Frisbee around for a half hour. Right. Uh, play uh, helps you get into a different mindset. So, um, you know, playing had always helped me with that, um, with creativity and getting me interested in design because design is actually, there's kind of a form of play in oh, that, yeah. especially when you're sketching and thinking and creating yeah. ideas. Um, and and I, I mean, how do people discount that? But all throughout the process. Like everybody knows you gotta do it in the early phases, but 
there's so many times where you're in the production process and commercialization process and you're like there's an issue yeah or there's something you hadn't thought of comes up and you're like oh we're gonna do it this and you yeah you gotta play around with that a little bit that's right and then you're like a solution will come right yep. so i and i always i always am like super excited when we get to go all the way to production because there's so many of those that that's gonna like 10 of those things are gonna pop up <laughs> Mm -hmm. and, and those are all opportunities to make it better. That's right. Um, so, yeah. uh, in any case, I just kept getting more and more interested. And of course, I took all the art classes I could in high school. But you know, where I where I grew up uh, in El Paso, Texas, there wasn't a, a really there really wasn't a design scene. Yeah. There really wasn't an art scene. So, uh, I didn't get a huge exposure to art. So I had to basically do it just try to get as much as I could by myself. But. Mm -hmm. um, I was always interested in design and in art to a degree, and uh, you know my first inclination was to be a car designer. So even when I was in junior high, I investigated design schools like Art Center and those mm -hmm. sorts of schools, um, and and uh, was very focused on being a designer. Always focused on being a designer because that's what I really I just liked it. I was yeah. focused on it. That's what I enjoyed, and that's what I knew uh, that I wanted to do for the rest of my life. I mean. Um, if I have to sit at a desk for eight hours a day, well, I want to be sketching. Right. I don't want to be, you know, looking at spreadsheets. Um, so I, th I think you're one of the only, and we, I, I always ask designers how they found it because we all have kind of like our own origin stories, mm -hmm. like not like our parents were like, hey, you should be an industrial right. designer. Like, yeah, they didn't know what it was. It. Yeah. And you're one of the only designers I think I've interviewed where I knew since I was a kid too, just like, even though I had no exposure, I just knew. Yeah. And I was always just drawing stuff. Like I used to open up the Sears uh, catalog at after school, at yeah. like in like third grade, and just open it to a random page and be like, "Oh, power drill! What's the future of power drill?" Yeah, just, you know, like doing well, a design project, you know. I mean, that's the thing. Like you yeah. look around. Well, this stuff didn't just pop up by itself. Somebody yeah. had to design it, yeah. right? So from from cars to furniture to, to footwear, I mean, this right. stuff is created. So who's creating that? So then you got to figure that out. Um, I mean, I, I got lucky in that in junior high, I saw there was like this uh, news program on at like 630 mm -hmm. and after school I happened to catch it or my mom was watching it and there was a segment on Art Center. So oh, that wow. was the key because then I figured, okay, so there's schools that offer programs in industrial design and they kind of focus on transportation, but they also yeah. did talk about the industrial design mm -hmm. program in that segment. I was like, oh, okay, so there's schools that you can go to that train you to be a professional designer. Yes. Um, Similarly, I was 13 and my dad saw an article on the front page of the Wall Street Journal about uh, Giorgio Giugiaro. And it was right. like, you know, a picture of like, you know, a car he had done, a tennis racket, a piece of pasta that hold it, holds sauce better. Yeah. I was like, yeah, that's it. That's yep. it. I'll do all those things. <laughs> yeah. That's so, I think if you get lucky, there's those, those key moments right. when you're a kid, it's like, okay, so that's where I need to go. That's what I need to do. Yeah. Uh, and so then that kind of all brought it together. And of course, and when I went to school, of course, it was a fit. I mean, when I got into the ID program, I was like, yeah, of course, this makes sense. Um, so, you know, for me, it, it was always a focus on uh, drawing um, and creating. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just knew that's what I wanted to do. And, and even when I was a kid, like school would just be so boring because I wanted to be at home playing with Legos. Yeah. I just wanted to be making stuff all the time. Yeah. Like I'd make something, enjoy it. I'd tear it down and make something else. And I was just so excited to do that. It was painful yeah. to be away from my box of Legos. Okay. And it sounds ridiculous, but it's just I, all I could think about at school was making stuff. Like, yeah. yeah. So I can't wait to get home so I can I can spend hours just making stuff. And I'd just be in my room for hours. Yeah. My mom told me recently that she used to come up and just open the door and check on me to see if I was okay because I'd probably, be building stuff with like you know Legos. You'd probably be all hunched over, yeah. putting blocks together for like eight hours on a mm -hmm. Saturday. And uh, I would be very specific. I would ask for very specific Lego sets because they might have one part. Yeah, I'd the say, piece oh, that you need. I want that one part. <laughs> you know, yeah. like, I don't care. You know, and they'd be like, Aren't you ever going to build what's on the box? Or never. I don't care. <laughs> Maybe I'd build it once and look at it for like three seconds. Yeah. And then <laughs> I and then you, you make something else. Yeah, I want to combine it with my other parts, you know? Yeah. yeah. But that, um, and I, I, at the time, I didn't realize that Legos were so popular, but, you yeah, know, it, the last 10, 15 years, I mean, Legos, the Lego culture has exploded. Yes. And even so many adults now are collectors. 
Yeah. Uh, and they collect kits, and those kits, there's like $500 kits now oh, yeah. that are super complex and intricate, which I think is great. I mean, yes. Yeah. I, I think that if you're into uh, Legos and you want to build kits, I say go for it because it is still so fun. Yeah. Um, you know, my job has replaced that. Right. So I Me too. don't yeah. necessarily have time to, to build, you know, uh, 10,000 piece Lego kits, but I, I enjoy the fact that Legos have just become so iconic. And there's everything from those little mini kits you get at Walgreens at right. the register that yeah, are like single. 10 pieces right. to, you know, multi thousand piece kits that are like the 911 GT3 and the right. you know huge Millennium Falcon set. I think that's great. Mm -hmm. I think that's just so awesome. And, and it, it, you know, kids 8 to 80 can play with that stuff. Yeah. I and mean, get something out of it. Yeah. And, they, and I love how they've gone back to, you remember for like in the 2000s there, they got these very like fewer parts, more complex parts. And you're like, oh, I'm just... It got it got un Lego y, yeah. it was just toy, more toy like, and they've really gone. I was I read an article how they worked really hard to go back to the roots and making more complicated sets right. again, and like going back to more basic pieces. Um, and I think it's I think they're doing awesome. Yeah, I mean, I got a Lego Technique set when I was ten. Yeah, uh, and it was the the little. It was basically a Volkswagen chassis. It had a flat four hung out the back. Yeah. two seats but the thing that really got me crazy with that says it had a working gearbox whoa that's, that's why cool. I wanted that set yeah it had a little uh, three-speed working gearbox mm -hmm. right like a manual transmission and so you could actually move the gears and then you had to build that transmission it would go back to this flat four engine that actually worked of course but the engine wasn't really the focus it was that transmission that they actually figured out a way to put this little geared transmission that you could actually shift into this Amazing. kit that you could build yourself. And when I got that thing, that, that really uh, took me to the next level because it was pretty complex. And it had gearing, but it taught me a lot about you know how things work inside. Yeah. And I mean, I built a body for it out of my extra Lego pieces, but that was really good from a, a mechanical standpoint in that, okay, there's, there's more than just the exterior of, of a thing. Right. There's these internal parts that go inside this thing, and this is how they function, this is how they work. So it was a, it was a basic lesson in mechanics and very basic engineering of, of well, how does a car work? So, right. you know, this, this engine turns and it spins these gears, and then when you shift the gear lever, it changes the ratios and it makes the car go faster, et cetera, et cetera. So that kit was amazing to me. Cool. Um, yeah, it was really cool. That little gearbox thing was, it was so great. So awesome. I had a, a Technics one that was more around like suspension and turning and stuff, I remember. And re a couple of years ago, I was working on a project and it required like a two bar linkage mm -hmm. uh, for like a, a, a turning, two turning wheels that, that um, you know, I didn't want the, the axle to pivot, right. right? I wanted the wheels to turn like this, yeah. like, on a, like on a car. And so, and the, the client was, you know, was not understanding it. And I was like, I totally remember building this in Legos as a kid. And I just hopped on Google and was like, Lego two bar steering linkage yeah. and pulled it up and showed it. And he was like, oh yeah. And cause it was, it's so easy to understand yeah. when it's in the Lego format, yep. right? And you're like, oh, I get it. Yeah, we could do that. Yeah, um, it has to be very basic in Lego. Yeah. Uh, at least in the old days. I think th yes. these days it's it's gotten a lot more complex. Right. Um, their kits now, I mean, I've seen some of the technique, uh, Technics kits that are uh, extremely complex, mm -hmm. uh, which is fine. Um, but yeah, the, the first Technics kits were, were a lot simpler. more basic. Yeah. A lot simpler. Yeah, like I think like the innovation was like you'd have like a long, you know, 10, 15 dot piece and it had the like, kind of cross drill mm -hmm. holes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so out of school, you went to Sharp. Yeah, no. So, uh, so I I graduated in '94 mm -hmm. into a kind of bad economy. Mm -hmm. uh, it was bad from like 1990 through like early '94, mm -hmm. but jobs were still kind of hard to come by in '94. Uh, and I graduated from Kendall College of Art and Design in Michigan in Grand Rapids, um, and it, great school. I had. I mean, it was such a great experience. I, I, I still really remember it fondly. To say. I, I think about it every so often. It's like, man, that was such a great experience. Um, unfortunately, the economy was still kind of shaky. Um, so I moved back home to Texas, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, thought out for six months um, in Houston, and then uh, just kept networking. 
-hmm. for a long time, trying to find something, doing you know part-time jobs uh, until I found an internship at a small product development firm in Houston, and worked there for about a year and a half before I went to Sharp okay. in Memphis. So I actually did work for a small little product development firm. It was just me and, and the founder yeah. for about a year and a half working mm -hmm. on medical products. Mm -hmm. um, and that was pretty interesting because that was really about uh, helping him build that business where you know he was working out of his house and then he got an office and hired me and then we worked together on stuff and we were doing everything from designing to actually building prototypes in, in that office, mm -hmm. which was a pretty steep learning curve for me at the time because I'd only interned at a place that manufactured things but just very high level design capacity. So actually making and assembling prototypes was a, a, a new experience for me. Getting, you know, uh, prototype parts, uh, finishing them, putting them together, uh, you know, for a client presentation was, uh, um, it was, it was a, a lot of work and a little scary, but I learned a lot from it. And then I went to Sharp and worked there for about three and a half years yeah. uh, on appliances and televisions and that sort of thing. What was that like, working for, for like a, a U.S. Uh, arm of a, uh, Japanese corporation. Yeah. So that was actually probably probably a turning point for me in my profession because I worked with a lot of Japanese designers um, uh, at the facility in Memphis, which is where this design center was, and in Japan. So I would go to Japan for meetings over there you know, every six months. They would always send a designer over there. So it was either me or some of the other guys or my boss. Mm -hmm. And I got to go over there a bunch of times, which was great. Yeah. Uh, really good experience um, because I'd always wanted to go to Japan. What a cool exposure that early in your Great career, exposure. Right? Oh, yeah. I mean, I was hugely, when I think, look back on it now, I was hugely lucky because I was still in my 20s. And yeah. it was like, you're going to send me to Japan for two weeks to sit in meetings and, and you know, go tour Tokyo and Osaka and all that. Right. I'll do that. So that was a great experience. Um, and working with the designers there and the designers that, would, that worked in our facility from Japan was great because, um, you know, Japan is really renowned for its minimalism mm -hmm. in industrial design. Mm -hmm. Not everything, but a right. lot of it is still about minimalism. And we yeah. were... Like Sony of the era. Like all yeah. Like yeah. It's kind of Sony, Sharp, Panasonic stuff. Yeah. It was all just like just what you need. Right. And um, that's a good way to put it. Uh, a lot of the designers I worked with, you know, came out of school in the 80s, mm -hmm. like 70s and 80s. They were older than me and yeah. they had more experience, but they uh, um, kind of had this um, philosophy of minimalism, mm -hmm. which was kind of antithetical to what was going on in the 90s. Like in the, the 90s, there was a lot of. Uh, you know, organic shapes and right. a lot of detailing. And of course, you know, in the late nineties, Apple was doing all those crazy right. laptops and the iMac and stuff like that. But these guys were still doing very simple, minimal things. And I didn't really get it when I first started, mm -hmm. but being around that long enough, it started to sink in. And uh, I didn't realize that at the time, but then when Apple went super minimal in the early 2000s, then it was like, oh, that, that all kind of made sense. It was like, they because they right. went to Japan and saw what the Japanese right. were doing, and they brought that into what they were doing in the 2000s. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, that you know what? That actually makes a lot, just, just what you need, like reduced to the simplest mm -hmm. um, for whatever design. So being exposed to that design philosophy was really critical uh, and really informed a lot of what I've done in the last 15, 20 years. Um, just you know, reduce the amount of elements because, mm -hmm. or try to create simple concepts up front. Yeah. Because the engineers will always add stuff. Right. Or you know, the executive team always adds stuff right. later on. So create those really. Your, those would be your opportunities to add details. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Up, you know? <laughs> that was the lesson that I learned, right. and that and that sharp experience helped me because it was about creating really simple, almost like cartoonish, iconic mm -hmm. concepts. And you can still make variations, but then presenting that because right. it's going to get, there's going to be details added against your will right. down the road. That's just you, what happens. You're going to need a dog house for a power cable or whatever. whatever. You know? You're yeah. going to make that a detail. So they really taught me a lot about minimalism and simplicity mm -hmm. in a good way. Just uh, reduce the elements, you know, make iconic concepts. Um, uh, keep it very simple. Yeah. 
um, and try to <coughs> maintain that simplicity as you go forward to production and, and uh, uh, solve these manufacturing problems uh, with simplicity in mind. Yeah. And that was what they were really good at. Um, so, uh, you know, from that standpoint, I, I learned a ton and I got a chance to go to Muji uh, when I was there. And that was early like, days. Yeah. Early, I didn't know what Muji was. Right. And I went to the Muji store in uh, oh, Harajuku. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know where I was at the time. They were like, yeah. oh, let's go to this Harajuku. I was like, okay, I don't know what that is. Yeah. But um, we went there and went couldn't to Google it. Yeah, yeah, couldn't Google yeah. it. Went to the Muji store and it was just all yeah. like, you know, clear plastic square boxes right. and white t shirts. And I was like, wow, what, what is this? But. You know, it, it did start to, to sink in after a while. It's like, oh, okay, now I, now I get that. Uh, and now Muji is kind of a worldwide brand where, you know, a lot of people know it. Um, oh, yeah. So that was, you know, I got exposed to a lot of stuff that I, I didn't really appreciate at the time, but later on I appreciated it a lot. And I really appreciated how the Japanese designers thought about mm -hmm. problems. Now, it, not everything is great, but how they thought about problems. Mm -hmm. And how they solve problems and how they work together as a team and how they collaborated yeah. uh, was really informative. Um, you know, the collaboration aspect was was key as well. Uh, it, it's not really about getting your idea right. into production. It's about getting the best idea yep. into production, right? Uh, and then working together yeah. to do that. So that that was a, a, a really good learning from them too which is not the American way to do things. Right. And what was the workflow in the in the studio like at that time? Were you guys like building hand prototypes or what? I mean, because it was, what was it, 96 or something like that? Yeah, so we got Alias into the studio in 96. Mm -hmm. So uh, we were already working on Illustrator and Photoshop and then we got Alias, so we were already getting super digital. Mm -hmm. uh, and I had actually, uh, knew CAD before I got there. So I actually kind of pushed to get CAD in there because I knew gotcha. that was coming. Yeah. Um, and I preferred CAD. Mm -hmm. I mean, models are fine. Yeah. But, uh, you know, personally, um, even in the 90s, you could see the writing on the wall yeah. that digital tools are going to take over, For sure. you know, our industry. Mm -hmm. So you better get used to them now because it's just going to happen. And I mean, you could already see that development times were, were, were moving faster and faster. So yeah. the only way to keep up with compressed development times was to to really incorporate digital tools and not really noodle around with uh, you know foam core mockups as much. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's just a reality. Mm -hmm. So I m my personal imperative was always to get comfortable with digital tools, you know, a two D and three D digital tools as quickly as possible, so that in the future I would be comfortable enough with those to roll them into a process where I wouldn't have as much time to make mock-ups, right? So that I would be very familiar with the 3D space right. in CAD and know what worked and what didn't so that it would come out right when they manufactured it. Right. Um, but we did still do some mock-ups. Um, uh, you know, we did build some stuff or we had prototypes made. Mm -hmm. um, you know, again, we worked on big stuff. We worked on microwaves and televisions. Right. So that stuff had to actually be built by model shops. Right, of course. Um, and so... Uh, you know the uh, a a uh, when we worked on all American market stuff, so uh, the the uh, design brief would come from Osaka headquarters and say we're going to develop this range of say televisions for mm -hmm. the following year, so we need to work on concepts for the family line, and so the three three of us designers would work on that stuff, and we were actually doing hand sketches at the beginning. Uh, but then we converted to Illustrator and then to Photoshop. Um, so we'd create sketches and share the sketches and put them up on the wall and we'd talk about them and, and decide which was the best and then how we tweak it and that sort of thing. And then there would be input by the section manager who was my direct boss and then there was the, the um, division manager who was his boss. But they, we all worked in the same studio. It was a small studio. It was maybe five people. Okay. And then we had a graphic designer too. Um, and, uh, you know, we'd make mock-ups of smaller stuff yeah. uh, ourselves. We had a little shop in the back, but the, the bigger stuff, because they were televisions and microwaves, we just couldn't make that stuff. Mm -hmm. we'd, we'd have to get it, we'd have to send it out to, to get it manufactured. But, you know, the process was pretty typical. Mm -hmm. um, it was just the, uh, the point of view was a little bit different with, from the Japanese designers because mm -hmm. they were all from Japan, so they had a different view of the world than we did being uh, from the States, um, you know, because these guys have all, had all grown up in Japan, so they were they were looking at it a lot differently I than bet. we were. Yeah. So that actually, uh, 
you know, made us think differently about what we were doing, um, which again was a was a good influence ultimately. Um, so, uh, you know, the, I think the process was was pretty typical for the time. It was just the point of view was a little bit different because you know we were working with a Japanese team instead of an all American team. Right. No, I was just curious. Yeah. And that was, I mean, because you you that was a corporate experience for you, and then after that you went to Ziba. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah. that brought you out to Portland. Yeah. Brought me out to Portland. Worked for Ziba for a couple of years. Um, and of course that was way more intense because, uh, you know, a firm like Ziba <coughs> working on, uh, client projects on a consulting firm is much different. Right. Uh, so whereas uh, a corporate gig, you know, it's very slow. Um, you have a lot of time to develop things, almost too much time right. in my opinion. So I'd say sometimes you have you know, time to second guess, which is not always, yeah. not always good. And I mean, internal corporate decision making mm -hmm. sometimes doesn't move that fast, and then they just cancel things out of the blue mm -hmm. uh, for reasons that they don't tell you. Uh, mm -hmm. Although there probably are reasons, they just don't let the the rank and file know about it. Mm -hmm. So those were the downsides of the corporate experience: is just uh, the lack of visibility, the lack of communication, the uh, uh, random decision making or arbitrary decision making. Um, and in those, in a in a consulting firm like Ziva, uh, which is a lot bigger now. Um, those things don't exist. I mean, when a when a client comes to a consulting firm, right, they want it done now. Right, they're paying. They're paying. They they're coming to you because they know you can do it fast, mm -hmm. uh, and or that you can move quickly, um, and that they'll get the result, you know, fairly quickly, quicker than they could do it internally. Mm -hmm. So you know you, so it's kind of a pressure cooker right. in that case, right? Um, and that you've got to work really fast and, and everybody's on board with that, but it's a lot more late nights and staying late and you know just cranking out a lot of work. But that's actually good because um, what Ziba taught me was actually just increasing my output, mm -hmm. right? My creative output. So just sketching a lot more, jumping from project to project that needed help, mm -hmm. right? So, so you'd be working on your own assigned projects that right. you were, you know, a key designer on, and then you jump into other projects that needed help, either right. just brainstorming or helping them get pull a presentation together, mm -hmm. or helping them flesh out a design or whatever. So uh, it teaches you a lot about flexibility, and then you can really build your portfolio working at a place like Ziva because you're just working on a ton of different projects, yeah. and you meet a lot more people uh, there too. For me personally, I, I find I have kind of like an optimum volume. Like if I'm you know, obviously people know if you're working on too much, you spread too thin, quality goes down. Yeah, that's right. Uh, which of course, right? And for me, there's also something true a little bit at the opposite end of the spectrum where if I'm not like working on enough, I'm not like excited enough and stimulated yeah. enough. I need to have like the right amount of balls in the air. Yeah. And I also find the projects, um, like you get more kind of like cross pollination mm -hmm. because I think both of us also don't have a specialty like I know some firms are just like oh we only do footwear we don't right do that. I yeah. do all different things so working on an architectural project and like a smartwatch yeah but there's this weird like uh, material I researched for this thing might influence something over here yeah and yeah. Um, I like to have I guess enough work in the studio at any one time for those random kind of balls to hit each other yeah um, do you find similar like where you have like or did you find that as Eva, I guess, where there was that more higher level of activity? Well, there's, I, I think what you're talking about is like kind of the cross-pollination of, yeah. of ideas or concepts yeah. that can influence other projects, and that's totally true. I didn't find that so much at Ziba, but I do find that on my own. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, at Ziba and then at the other uh, product development company or, you know, design company I worked for, Fiori, um, those... Uh, consultancies were big enough where you got stuck on really big projects, got which it. is great, yeah. but then you don't have the opportunity to spin as right. much onto other You're projects. Just right? on You're just working on, yeah, <laughs> FedEx. Right? My two big yeah. clients there were FedEx and Whirlpool. Yeah. That's what I worked on primarily there. Gotcha. And they were multi year, huge strategy projects. Again, it was great. I learned a ton. The downside was that you don't get to spin through you know, a bunch of projects in a month or three months or six right. months. You're just working on these multi-year big strategy projects. Um, and uh, the, the downside to that 
is that you're not getting new ideas from other places. You're just very focused on you know, completing this strategy piece for this client and making sure that it's the best that it can be. Uh, and uh, it was great at the time because the, the portfolio piece I got for FedEx and Whirlpool was awesome. Right. I mean, just such a high level of work. I remember um, that FedEx work, that was it was, it was so a, fun. And it like won awards, and yeah. Yeah, it was great. It was great. And it did, that, that strategy piece did filter down into the actual tools at FedEx. Mm -hmm. I still see the tools that they're using, and yeah. you, you can see the design elements on their little I scanners. Re yeah, I re if I remember right, too, like, wasn't there, like, a little, like, a hand truck, and it had, like, kind of, like, big perf pad? Mm -hmm. It did, yeah. I remember that. Yeah. Yeah, the hand truck was great. That was yeah. probably one of my favorite pieces. Uh, you know, unfortunately, FedEx was just not in a position at the time. This was in 2001. Yeah. Uh, af like after 9-11 when shipping just went right gotcha. to the toilet yeah they they couldn't afford to do their own hand that's truck. a lot of like a yeah. huge that's investment. A big investment yeah huge investment would have been cool but would have been great yeah but yeah after 9-11 it was just like their business went right into the toilet mm -hmm. and they couldn't do anything at least uh, they published it the work so that was nice and it well it, yeah. and it did you know, it did influence mm -hmm. follow-on stuff years later, right. uh, long after I was gone. But but you know, nine eleven really killed the the shipping industry, mm -hmm. and of course the airline industry too. But it really hurt FedEx and UPS. Mm -hmm. um, so they kind of had to shelve everything that they were doing mm -hmm. uh, at the time, including even renovating their shipping centers and that sort of thing. Wow. That didn't come until years later when they finally kind of recovered. Um, so you know, a good lesson there. This is off topic, but a good lesson there is that. With the best intentions and the best talent and all the money in the world behind you, there are unforeseen events that can totally derail your projects. Right. So my philosophy has been, especially the last 20 years, is to, to be not only a good student of your profession, design, but also be a good student of the world around you. Mm -hmm. Understand politics, understand economics, understand you know the the social aspects mm -hmm. of where you live, or you know your country or the world, right? Because those things all influence what you're doing from a design standpoint, and those world issues can affect what you're working on. Nine Eleven right. directly affected the projects we were working on. Right. I mean, it had a direct impact to that. So. Um, you know, being aware of what's going on in the world just helps you be more prepared for those sorts of things. Um, I think that's something that we don't talk a lot about in design, um, and uh, I think that kind of I think designers have a tend to have more of like a larger cultural sensitivity or an interest, right? Yeah. Like it, you know, obviously, like outside of design uh, into arts and music, um, but yeah, I mean, whenever I get together, like when we had brunch yesterday like topics go to politics pretty quick like we're interested in these like concepts and ideas yeah. and, and being aware and educated on them and you're, you're absolutely right that does affect our work right where you're like well if you have a sense of what the economy is going to do next year you could plan out your work and your business that's right so yeah and I mean just understanding uh, where the world is headed um, what's going on in the world what are the trends both economically technologically mm -hmm. socially all those things uh, will influence your work and help you be prepared for the future mm -hmm. uh, and you know obviously trying to be as factual as possible so, so really you know being a good reader and, and reading from a range of sources uh, yeah. and uh, really understanding those things and, and of course I, I spend about 30 minutes to an hour every morning uh, just going through all my favorite blogs and uh, reading newsletters that come into my inbox and those sorts of things uh, just to get a high level view of what's going on right. but then there's there's supplemental reading that I do uh, at night or you know at lunch or whatever just <clears throat> reading different sources uh, news magazines that sort of thing so um, those things are all really important to understand not only for your profession but just being a good citizen mm -hmm. of the planet right try to be as informed as possible uh, and and get a balanced set of information uh, and try to get your information from sources that, that you know, are legitimate or um, that you trust, that sort of thing. Um, and uh, that can help inform what it is you're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, because it is really important, and I do find that it does come in handy on projects to know these things. Yeah. Um, the, to, to, you can build in those uh, um, learnings into your projects as you go forward. One thing I've noticed from you know, working with so I've been two and a half years, I think, this month, 
since I started my studio, and I noticed this even before I started it with previous companies that I worked at, that the like the, the shape of the sales distribution is changing so much in terms of price point. So like, I think, you know, if a few years ago, the, the sales distribution tended to look more like a bell curve mm -hmm. where, you know, you had sales at the entry level and then people kind of stepping up into these kind of nice, easy step up price points. And then you had, you know, less people in the high end, less, less dollars in the high end. So this is like dollars. Yep. And this is, yeah, low. Let's say entry, entry price, entry product to high end product. And this used to be like the meat of the market. Yeah, yeah. this used to be the meat, right? This kind of like middle stuff. And almost all of my clients over the last five years or so have experienced a total flip where you know the bulk of the sales is in the entry level and then like a precipitous mm -hmm. drop into the mid price stuff no one's stepping up and then like sales increasing yeah at the high, in, end. At the high end yeah um and obviously there's huge socioeconomic factors that are driving this right yep. where people are like look i need i need something really good down here um and then uh, and then people being like either i'm gonna i've you know divested in everything and i've decided like whatever coffee stereo equipment cars are my thing so i'm going to overspend here or this is just a, a rich right. person yep right and so you see this, that's really affecting the aesthetics right where like all this stuff is getting like very simple kind of minimum viable product syndrome yeah and then this stuff is getting like cartoonishly lavish and right like, oh my god it's so tacky like uh, you look at some of the automobiles over here or anything and you're like, oh, that's but yeah, gross. as you get as you get further over here, it starts to get really uh, insane as yes. far as the accoutrements and features and and the materials. Yeah, and yeah, this is like super commoditized, but you know, and, and Amazon probably plays kind yes. of in this area. Yeah, this uh, is and, like and Amazon Walmart. basics. Yeah, Amazon <laughs> and Walmart play in this area right. that they're it's it's all price price pressure pushing manufacturers right. to decrease their prices. And then specialty manufacturers over here yeah. uh, creating limited run, super expensive products for rich people. Yeah, this is like we're gonna put uh, crisp embed crystals in constellations on your roof liner. Yeah. Like, what? Okay. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, there's always room for that. Sure. In a healthy market, you've got room for everything. I think the concern is is this area. Right. Right. So, Huge concern. So this area is just dropping too low, uh, and that's probably not sustainable. Because this is very low margin, yeah. Right, high volume, low margin. This is high margin but very low volume. Right. And so this used to be kind of like where a lot of the innovative stuff would happen because mm -hmm. you had good volume and good margin. Right. And uh, but a lot of the innovation is now here because yeah. like this is where the smartphones have pushed into. Yes. Uh, right. And You're I right. think uh, what was the manufacturers? Was it HTC? One of the Asian manufacturers is going to introduce a twenty eight hundred dollars smartphone Whoa, okay. that I think has a folding screen or some feature oh, okay. on it. Yeah, uh, which is really expensive. I mean, right. people thought a thousand dollar iPhone was expensive. Twenty eight hundred dollar right. smartphone is really expensive. So for something that's going to be obsolete in eighteen months, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. So you're you're seeing you know smartphone manufacturers trying to push into this space so they can still make money uh, mm -hmm. with thousand dollar, twelve hundred dollar, fifteen hundred dollar, right. Uh, you know, mobile devices, whether it's a smartphone mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, a larger phone or an iPad uh, or, you know, some kind of uh, uh, notebook device, they're pushing into this space, just trying to get that price point up so mm -hmm. that they can still make money uh, and sustain their business. Um, uh, and then, of course, there's stuff at the low end, uh, and it's fine, mm -hmm. but it tends to be defeatured. Uh, you know, you're getting lower end processors, that sort of thing. Right. Uh, and those devices, tend to be obsolete even faster because they're made so much more cheaply. Right, and they're on old platforms a lot of times. Yeah. I mean, like an older chip. Or yeah, older you know. software yeah. that doesn't get upgraded or can't handle the new upgrades, so right. that's obsolete even faster. Right. Whereas if you buy a higher-end smartphone, which is way more expensive, you usually get more longevity out of it because it it's got a better processor that can handle more software upgrades. Right. These lower-end ones sometimes can, and then they've got to upgrade again right. because they it's just it doesn't work anymore. It's just not, it's gotten slow or whatever. Um, so this is actually creating potentially a lot of waste totally. at this end of the market too, which is obviously another issue that designers should be thinking about it, which is this, this push towards sustainability mm -hmm. and packaging, product design, uh, manufacturing, all those areas, uh, you know, how can designers help support right. sustainability? 
and still make a, a product that is desirable and that people want and helps you know your com- your client or company make money. Right. Um, it's a huge issue, and that actually kind of goes back to when I worked at Sharp. We were still making tube televisions at Sharp. Mm-hmm. I mean, in the '90s, it was all tube televisions. Right, of Flat screens didn't really become popular until the late 2000s. I mean, Sharp was kind of a leader with the whole yeah Aqua stuff, right? But yeah. Yep. So, well, Aquos probably didn't come on until the 2000s. They were okay. just, I don't remember what the, the brand, the sub-brand was, mm-hmm. but but they were making huge tube televisions. The enclosures were huge. Mm-hmm. You know, even a 25-inch television, those enclosures right. were giant. Right. And they required big tools to make, and they used a lot of material. Uh, so um, that is just a lot of waste when you're yeah. done with that. They're like, what do you do with that? Yeah. I mean, and the tube television itself is massive and yeah. there's a massive amount of materials in there and it has a big capacitor on the back mm-hmm. which holds electricity so you weren't supposed to touch that or you might get you know right <laughs> shock it's building up charge right it's got to save a charge mm-hmm. to turn the television on um so uh you know i th- i think we've gotten better in that things are getting smaller uh but we still have a ways to go on and figuring out a way to implement a cradle to cradle product uh, model into our society mm-hmm. right where you buy a product you use a product it goes back to the manufacturer to become a new product yeah right that's what that would be the goal yes and we're, we're just not there yet and and I I know that companies are starting to push toward that and they're those those systems are starting to come online although they're not you know haven't been propagated throughout mm-hmm. the entire uh, you know, product infrastructure or, or manufacturing infrastructure, and we will get there. But we still have work to do there. Where it's like, okay, I bought this television. Yeah. Either this television doesn't work anymore. I'm going to upgrade. I want to send it back to the manufacturer so that they can take it apart and make it into something new. Yeah, that's the goal. Yeah, even like I mean, even a non-tech product or not a high-tech product, but like a, a toaster. Right. Maybe like my fa- like my parents just get like a fourteen dollar toaster from Walmart like every two years. Yeah. And I, I have a expensive toaster of a dual it, but I got it in two thousand when I got when I got married and yeah. I make toast with it every morning for twenty years. Yeah. And it has zero features other than toasting. Yeah. <laughs> and that's it. And and but you know, I probably spent less in the past twenty years on toasters. Yeah. Than, and, so, and you haven't put five toasters in the land. And I have not, exactly right. So yeah. that's the other side of the coin, which is, do you want to pay, uh, say, $500 for 10 coffee makers at 50 bucks a piece, right? Right. Or do you want to pay $500 for one coffee maker that you'll have for the rest of your life right. and won't go into the landfill? Especially like that single task device that's just like, there's, I don't need any toast innovation. I just needed to make coffee. I needed to make toast reliably. And, yeah, and so and last and last and I like this is going to be the first and last toaster I buy, and it right. may be more expensive, but in the long term it pays off. But I think that in at least in the U.S. market, the consumer has been taught to think in a disposable way, mm-hmm. not in a strategic, long-lasting way. Right, um, and I think that's a problem. Um, and economically, you have to be able to afford that. That's it. You know? Yeah, that's right. That's right. And so that's a problem too. Yeah, like it is. like uh, if it's if if uh, a person on an average income. You know, can't afford this really expensive device that's going to last a lifetime. Well, then what do we do? Right. So then we do have to implement a system where, if they buy a fourteen dollar toaster, that toaster can be reclaimed. Yeah. Right. So can can we reclaim that 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 device somehow? Yeah. And it doesn't go into the landfill. Is, is Eric Lee okay? Okay. <laughs> Just checking. <laughs> Let me regroup. Okay. Um. So. Um, sorry, I lost my train of thought there. But so I just wanted I wanted to back up a little bit to uh, so how long have you had your own studio now? So that's coming up on fifteen years. Congrats. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. It kinda crept on me crept up on me uh, quickly because you know, when you first start out, uh, it's like, oh, year one, okay, well that was tough. And then right. year two, you're like, wow, I can't believe I made it. Yeah. But by year eight, you're just rolling. Yeah. And then the years start coming faster. And, uh, you know, before you know it, you've been doing this, you know, over a decade and a half mm-hmm. on your own, supporting your business, mm-hmm. working with clients, you know, creating relationships um, and hopefully creating great products 
yeah. for your client and for the marketplace. Um, and as you know, running your own business is a little bit different experience mm -hmm. uh, than working for somebody else, but it has huge upsides and then there's definitely some downsides. Right. Um, but the upsides are, and the reason that I decided to hang out my own shingle mm -hmm. was because I really wanted to work directly with the client. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't really want a project manager mm -hmm. or another uh, partner in between me and the client. And not that there's anything wrong with that. Sure, it's just yeah. that for me personally, I felt like I couldn't be as effective unless I was interfacing and managing that relationship directly. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, assembling my own team to do turnkey projects, right? So, yeah. I mean, the kind of services we offer is anything from branding strategy, but our core is design and product development. Right. Uh, really, and even helping people create businesses now, mm -hmm. it, because, uh, you know, the manufacturing world has changed a lot yeah. in the last 10 years, where there is way more startups now than there were in the early 2000s as far as hardware. Now, right. there was, there's always been internet startups. That's a, sure. that's a totally different thing. For hardware, there weren't there just weren't that many startups. The contract manufacturing, it's so attainable yeah. now. It's like, yeah, and, and I think there's a new generation of entrepreneurs out there right. um, who are younger, and they have grown up with Nike and Apple and all these big brands that really focused on design. Mm -hmm. And these are people that are younger than me that, that grew up in a different kind of world mm -hmm. where design was the focus mm -hmm. and they're now they're of an age where they you know have funds to start their own company and so they think about things differently than the generation you know before us right, right? Um, so they have a very different mindset and and design is part of the equation so when you work with people like that it's a much different experience than working with a company that that's that's angry because they have to have design right but if they don't have it they're going to fail in the marketplace right so it's a difference between a, a company that sees it as a cost and a company right. that sees it as a reason to as, be. as, as a value yeah. add right like, yeah oh, that's a, that's who we are yeah i think it, it makes it, me think of like your work with ratio yeah where it could have been easy for them to fall into the trap of making something rather technical, this like technical pour over coffee device, and it could have just looked like a science project. Right. But instead, clearly they, you know, the relationship you have with them led to this beautiful design. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. yeah so the, uh, yeah. You, so you called it right there the uh, uh, science project. So yeah. that came up early on, mm -hmm. <laughs> and the founder Mark Helwig. He was specifically like, I don't want this to look like a science project. Right, yeah. Because a lot of those kind of homebrew mm -hmm. specialty coffee makers did look like science projects. Right. I mean, it looks like I need to have a degree to use that thing. Yeah, yeah. it's like a bunch of, yeah. you know, extrusions and right. glass beakers and stuff like that. And that's fine for the super enthusiast. Sure. There's a small niche mm -hmm. in the coffee world. They love that stuff. Right. And I am all for that. I like you guys, you have at it, but mm -hmm. for the kind of consumer that Ratio wanted to reach, it just can't be that way. It's too intimidating. Because it was, I, I see what the work that you guys did was bringing the pour over to, to the, a normal person's home. Exactly. Right? And who yep. was like, I don't want to, it's too technical, it's intimidating, this thing does. Yes. And that's what it looks like. You're like, oh, it, yeah. it's like a really nice looking coffee maker. It's an automated pour over, yeah. so it, you don't have to do anything, but it gives you that pour over flavor, which is right. which has become very trendy. Yes. Right. Pour over became super trendy in the last five years. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been a thing in Portland for a while yeah. in, the, in these kind of cities That's where it. coffee yeah. is a thing. Uh, but in places where coffee really isn't a thing, people can get intimidated by that. It's like, right. oh, wait, you want me to boil some water and then pour it through this filter basket and weigh it and yeah. time it and and there's a right way to do it <laughs> yeah most yeah. people aren't going to do that they're that's very intimidating but you know when people say hey pour over coffee tastes really good mm -hmm. but here's a machine that'll just do it for you and it doesn't look like a science experiment then that's that was the goal mm -hmm. and and that market's starting to really fill with those kind of devices now because people uh, more people are becoming aware of pour over and how great it is um and there's a certain process to it uh, and you don't want that technology to look scary and intimidating. You want it to look nice and beautiful and, and approachable. Uh, and you, we have one button on the machine. Right. That's all you need. Uh, at some someday, you know, the device will be app enabled. Mm -hmm. But right now, it's not. 
It's just one button and it does the job. And I think that in some areas that's what people are looking for yeah. because I, I do sense some pushback from the average consumer on the technology side where they get frustrated with smart devices where it's yeah. just it's too complicated and it doesn't do it and then it crashes and then it falls off the network and then you know all this stuff and and i get frustrated too where you know like we have a smart tv and sometimes yeah. that thing falls off the network and then i have to get it back on the network and and i can see how and you're like oh my shoes didn't unpair from my phone and i can't right. tie them you're like ah yeah, yeah, like what? No, yeah, no, no, that's not the life that these right. people want. I mean, I I like tech, sure. so I'll put up with it. Yeah. But my wife, she's like the average consumer. Right. She does not want to deal with any of that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I sense the frustration. So there's got to be a way to make this technology simpler and more approachable and not scary and not frustrating. Mm -hmm. Right. That's our job. Yes. Is to, is to make this stuff not frustrating, and I I think uh, w you know I do encounter that from time to time where, you know, if you work with a company where engineers rule the day, um, or rule the company, uh, you you can experience some inertia where it's just like, hey, we're just gonna do, we're gonna implement this feature, and, and that's what we're doing because we want to, yeah. yeah, and we don't care how it works, we just like it, right. and it's like, well, but have you thought about the user? I mean, let's think about the average user who might be frustrated with this. Like, no, we don't care. We're just going to implement it. So those are the kind of hurdles that I think designers uh, have to overcome. And that's something, you know, going back to consulting, working with clients, it's it's part of a, of a process of education where you want to make them aware. It's like, look, I'm. We, let's think about the user. Yeah. This isn't about me. It isn't about you. We're thinking about the person that we're designing this for and removing frustration from their life and mm -hmm. hopefully adding some beauty right. to their life at the same time at the right you know at the right price point right and that's a tricky thing um, so but that's all just a continuous process mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think it's changing uh, and again working with these this younger generation of entrepreneurs that is great for designers because they really uh, you know as a whole they do understand design's role a lot better it makes my job easier so so james owen design has been been crushing it for 15 years where, well, where do you see your, yourself in 15 well I, I always like imagine myself as one of those old italian designers yeah. who like uh like one of my favorite italian designers is uh, marcello gandini Mm -hmm. uh, he oh, designed yeah. the Lamborghini Maiura and Countach yeah. and among other great cars. And he still designs stuff. Mm -hmm. um, at least he was designing up until a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. He may be fully retired now. He's probably in his 70s or 80s. But, um, you know, those guys, uh, These there's like this old Italian designer archetype who they just keep designing stuff. They're in their 80s and they're still working. Yeah. Right. Maybe they're not working as hard as they were sure. 20 years ago, but they're still doing it. Um, and, and you look at like Frank Lloyd Wright's career. Yeah, I mean his last decade from <clears throat> seventy to eighty years old was like his most prolific time. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I mean his it, the the last building he worked on before he died was the Guggenheim. Right, uh, and he that died during construction. Yeah, yeah, and that's iconic. Yeah, uh, that's that's a you know a, a architectural icon known I, around the world. I remember reading a story about him about when he passed. I think he was eighty two or eighty three, and he was like working at the drawing board. Yeah. And was like, I don't feel good. And they took him to the hospital and like he died. Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, you know, he's just like just going the whole time. Yep. You know? He's still creating, doing what he loves. So I think that would be the model yeah. is as long as you're uh, physically able to do it and you have right. an interest, keep doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe again, maybe not as intensely as I'm doing it now. Sure. Uh, that may be 20, 25 years from now, but definitely just keep I'm in it because I enjoy it and I learn something on every new project mm -hmm. I meet new people I you know experience new relationships and I always try to maintain a, a breadth of different kinds of projects in the studio because that's what's interesting to me because I'll always learn something on every project yeah. I mean I bring something to the table but I always learn something new right and that's what keeps me going is this continu you know, continuous improvement that we talked about, mm -hmm. but this continuous learning. Mm -hmm. You can always learn stuff. You'll never know everything. Yeah. But you know, the search for knowledge should never end, and the search for improvement should never end. You can always improve. You can always learn. You can always get better. And that's what keeps me going with 
from, from a, the consulting side. Yeah. Uh, if I you know worked inside of a corporation, I would be really afraid I would stagnate. Um, especially if you were just doing the same kind of thing over and over. I think I, I right. just don't think I can do that. I, I know that's great for some people. Sure. We're um, all we're all different. You know, we're all different. There's, there's room in the industry for different designers. Right? Yeah, that's right. That's yeah. right. And some people are super happy to do that, and right. I'm glad that they're there. Um, but for me, I can't, I can't do that because I, I'm just interested in different things. I'm interested in, in doing different things and, and uh, working on different kind of projects. And so that's what keeps me going. And uh, that's what I want to continue to do. And I, I think I would just continue to do it. Uh, you know, keep yeah. uh, uh, improving my reputation and getting to know more people so that I can get those opportunities to work on different kinds of projects with different kinds of people. Uh, and that is what's satisfying. For me is that experience yeah. uh, you know obviously the the creating something great that uh, helps the company and helps the user that is the goal but right. the benefit to me is is learning and the satisfaction of doing something and then collaborating with different people yeah well thanks for joining us on one to one sure but before okay. uh, before you go though we got to give everybody a good look at oh at your, at your watch okay so this is this is uh, this is the reissue from from Aliens, right? Right. Yeah. So so this is actually uh, designed by Giorgetto Giugiaro mm -hmm. back in the '80s, um, and this was a reissue. And so some of the original ones go for big bucks on eBay. Um, those are out of my price range. Um, but yeah, this this was the watch that was worn by Ripley in the movie Aliens, uh, and then there was a there was another version of this watch that was. Uh, worn by uh, Bishop, the Android. Okay. So there was two versions of this watch. And I think you can still find these reissues on eBay for a reasonable price. But um, this design is just so interesting because it came from kind of a groundbreaking sci-fi movie, number one. And it was worn by the heroine who was badass. Right. Right? I mean, just a great uh, heroine in, a, in almost any sci-fi movie. Yeah. Totally. Um, but the design is just so cool. And it's just totally 80s. Yeah. But I still like it. I, I Beautiful. Do, it looks fresh. The materials yeah. are great. It's all metal. Um, and I assume this would be to activate the stopwatch. Yeah. Screen. So I don't know quite how these buttons work. Okay. <laughs> so the the yeah. instructions were in Japanese. Oh, okay. So it was a, it was t uh, you know JDM watch. Mm -hmm. I couldn't make sense of the instructions. I did watch a YouTube video once that that showed how the buttons work, but I forgot. Um, so uh, really, I, I just wear it because I love the design. I love the design of the face. Yeah. The color scheme is great. I mean, especially they've got yellow and orange working together on a, on a kind of a black, dark gray face, yeah. which is great. Um, but, uh, you know, it's in the watch world, it is considered kind of a design classic, uh, designed by Jujaro, yes. who designed some great vehicles, among other things. So, you know, you may not be able to find or afford any Jujaro cars, but you can certainly yeah. wear something of his on your wrist. And it's and it, again, it's, it's a great design. It's really simple shapes. Mm -hmm. It's circles and squares. So I do see quite a few Mark I golfs around Portland. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> That'd be that's the one true. you could get. Maybe none in good shape. No. But yeah, that's that's true. Yeah. You you do that's true. Yeah. The golf you can probably I feel like I feel like Bishops maybe went like this, like it was more of like a half circle and then the and then Oh uh, yeah, I think, I think that's right. I think that one was like that and then yeah. this one was with the Ripley's. Yeah. Yep. Yep, that's I think so that's cool. right. Well, I just wanted to get everybody Yeah, to yeah. Because it's awesome. Yeah, and I'm I'm a big watch fanatic. I love watches as a lot, you know, like a lot of designers do because it's uh, number one it's one of the few accessories that that men are allowed to wear yes um, but two uh, the great thing about watches and the reason that they haven't died even though smart watches have become prolific is that um, you know watches are like uh, it's just a little microcosm of design on your wrist it's, totally. it's a little statement it's like a car yeah. Um, and that you can there's so many varieties out there mm -hmm. and there's so many like you know the watch yeah. that you have I mean these do the same thing right but the expression is very different yeah I mean the, the, the essential function is telling time yeah but the execution it's very different between the two it's like a chair right like there's you know there's like an infinite amount of iterations on right. the chair they all like sit your butt down mm -hmm. right? yeah all so, of these tell time within a second right. of each other yeah 
but it's uh, it's it's a it's just a nice thing to have that does have a functional element, but it's uh, it's it's become as much uh, an accessory and, and fashion statement than anything. Which you know I, I think watches kind of have always been, but it's one of those things that it's like vinyl records, um, where yeah we have smart watches. I have a smart watch. Right. I don't wear it all the time because right. I, I kind of switch it up. I like to wear uh, right. regular watches and smart watches. I switch it up so. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, watches are one of those things where I am kind of retrograde. I, I do like a watch mm -hmm. just because it's it's fun. Yeah. You know, it's an area that I can kind of express myself. Totally. So. Yeah, it's just like a little, yeah, it's a little statement on your wrist. It's a little, it's a little architectural statement right on your wrist. Right. Yeah, a little design statement. Well, thanks for joining us today. Really sure. appreciate the time and um, yeah, look yeah. forward to our next get together. Great.